Good evening, everyone. This is Amanda Manier. You are listening to The Veteran's Voice. I am a veteran advocate and attorney at the Veterans Law Group, and you're listening to KABC 790 from Los Angeles. Um, this is the third of our shows that um, will be focusing on highlighting and celebrating veterans and organizations and people who are supporting veterans and helping them through whether it's navigate the VA process, navigate transitioning from the military, um, and also just highlighting some really great stories of people who have served. A little background about me. I um, grew up as a child with a healthy dose of respecting the military. My mom always taught us that it was our responsibility as civilians to take care of the military and their family while they served overseas. So I grew up by handing out and sending out care packages to people who were serving, whether it was during the Gulf War or even before. Um, I also live in Southern California, which means that I have a lot of friends who are serving and have served as well as their families. And I am so very happy to have a guest here today who I have a lot of respect for and you're going to hear some amazing things about. Um, Mike, are you on the line with us? I am Amanda. Awesome. Well, generally, I just go by first names here um, so that you can feel comfortable sharing with whatever you want to share. Um, but what I would love for you to do is just kind of talk a little bit about how you joined the military, why you wanted to serve. You're a U.S. Navy veteran. Um, tell me a little bit about that beginning. Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'll start off by saying thanks for having me on the program. I really appreciate the work that, that you're doing here. Uh, my background, uh, I joined the military primarily because my parents were immigrants from the Netherlands uh, and had suffered through World War II. Uh, they were teenagers uh, at the time. And in their recovery uh, in Europe, uh, the goal was to build a, a new life. And my dad, who was in the conscription service in the Dutch Army at the time, had the opportunity to to visit Canada as part of his uh, his time in conscription service, and uh, had a friend who lived uh, in California and was able to make a, a trip down there, and uh, you know had so much respect for what the U.S. was able to do um, in, in World War II uh, that he really wanted to begin a new life um, in in the United States. And, um, and support the United States. So when he and my mom got married, they began the visa process. Uh, and although it took a while, it took about five years for him to be able to make his way uh, out uh, to California. He started a new life out there and was just always really appreciative for uh, what uh, America stood for, what America did for the Netherlands during, uh, during World War II. And, um, I saw that as I was growing up, and I wanted to be able to continue uh, to serve uh, in that way. So when I left high school uh, and realized, uh, how am I going to continue uh, my career, my, my first and primary goal was uh, to, to do that in a way where I could serve in the military. That's amazing. So did you join the Navy right out of high school? Well, I, not really. It was a little bit of a circuitous uh, path. Uh, I, uh, I had uh, applications into you know, many of the common universities that, that you might imagine uh, going, to, going to here in Southern California. So I had uh, UCLA as well as um, uh, Boston College and the like. But I, I wanted to fly. And so I thought at that juncture, not knowing a whole lot uh, about uh, where's the best place to fly? I thought, well, I might as well go to the Air Force Academy because those, you know, that was that's the place where they have the, the Air Force uh, trains. That's the elite uh, service academy. So mm -hmm. I had applied to the Air Force Academy, but I was medically disqualified um, uh, because I had some breathing issues when I was a kid. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, it wasn't affecting me at the time because I was a high school athlete. I was a water polo player and a swimmer. And, uh, but because I had had this in my record, I, I got medically disqualified. So I had to figure out what I was going to do for a year. And even though I had uh, applications in and it got accepted to several of these other universities, I knew I wanted to go to a service academy. So yes. I, I went to Cal State Long Beach for a year. And then uh, while I was there, I started rowing on the crew team. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a new sport for me. 
And it turns out that the, the crew coach was best friends with the Naval Academy crew coach. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, he, he called him up and said, hey, I have a, I have a recruit for you. So uh, I ended up getting recruited to row crew at Navy. And that was right when Top Gun came out. And so, of course, <laughs> I was part of that, <laughs> that Top Gun generation where, hey, the Navy flies. And they go and uh, have cool things, you know, uh, flying off of jets and uh, flying off of aircraft carriers and the and- like. And so... And they wear really great sunglasses, as Tom Cruise has told us. That's interesting. My brother actually went into the Air Force Academy um, and and didn't and medically had to get discharged due to some um, asthma, breathing issues, and shin splints. That's interesting mm-hmm. that that's similar. Um, so, where did yeah. you serve while you were in the Navy? Yes. Yeah, so I graduated from the Naval Academy in 1991. So, as I sound old, it's because I'm getting there, but not quite mm-hmm. old yet. But. <laughs> uh, so I uh, I graduated ninety one and I I was a surface warfare officer. Uh, mm-hmm. So I began my Navy career right here in San Diego uh, at the surface warfare officer school, and then I was assigned to a Spruance class destroyer called the USS John Young BD nine seventy three. And uh, in, in the course of the next three years, I made a couple of Middle Eastern force deployments. So I was right in the, the thick of the first Persian Gulf War. And so I was the recipient of some of those care packages. Most likely that you, that you I was just that thinking package. that you could have gotten one of my care packages. I um, Very much just so. to We're recap. Real, yeah, absolutely. Just to recap real quickly, you were listening to the veterans voice. This is Amanda Manier and we are talking with Mike, who is a U.S. Navy veteran. He is also serving veterans at the time. Uh, right now, we're going to get into that a little bit into the next segment. Um, Mike, tell us a little bit about you ended up retiring, correct, through the military? I, I did. I served for 22 years and I retired in 2013. And then I began serving my next phase uh, of service as a government service employee, which I'm still doing to this day. Awesome. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in the next segment. You also have children who are serving, correct? I do. I do. Uh, So I've just been really grateful um, to uh, have them see the type of service that we were able to go through. I've had some really positive experiences in the military, challenging for sure, uh, Mm -hmm. but the military has always been really uh, supportive as a community, as a family. Um, they saw me serving, and uh, I have two sons that also uh, are currently uh, serving. One is a second lieutenant in the Air Force, and he ended up ironically going to the Air Force Academy <laughs> when uh, when I when I did it. So he's fulfilled my dream, and he's fulfilling my dream right now as he's uh, in the pipeline uh, for jet training. Um, and so excited for him. And then my second son is still at the Air Force Academy, and at this moment, he is probably training some of the brand new cadets that just showed up for Indoctrination Day this week. (laughs) Well, I bet they're having some fun, or not. Um, (laughs) And one of the things that I want to highlight, too, is that uh, just a a kind of a heart of service that I seem to run across so much with people who served in the military and their veterans. One of the reasons in which Mike and I know each other is that we both serve on a nonprofit board called Give Clean Water. And so not only does he help support veterans, he also helps support in the nonprofit world as well. Um, Mike, tell me a little bit more about like, did you serve the entire time in San Diego or have you been back and forth? Yeah, no, I was uh, kind of all around the world. I joined the Navy, see the world. So Mm -hmm. three years here in San Diego and then we... I lateral transferred to the meteorology and oceanography community, actually. And so I went through basic uh, oceanographic accession training, which was in uh, lovely Biloxi, Mississippi. And then spent a a little bit of time there and then went up to Monterey, California, which was uh, a nice area of the country and and, uh, did about five and a half years there for every meteorologist and oceanographer common in the pipeline is to get a master's degree in meteorology and oceanography. So I served for three years there, did a follow on to the postgraduate school, which is also located there. And then we did time overseas in Italy. Uh, during that uh, time overseas, I did participate in the, uh, the Balkan war and the conflict in Kosovo. And then mm-hmm. afterwards uh, came back Uh, to San Diego and spent the rest of my career back in San Diego. 
That's awesome. Was it always your intention to come back to Southern California? Well, (laughs) we love San Diego. I grew up in Orange County, California, and I have all my family here. And once you live in San Diego for any period of time, as you know, um, it's it's hard to leave sometimes. It's it's just great, great people, great weather, um, great things to do here, and a wonderful military community. So this has been our home. Yeah, definitely. It's um, like you've probably heard me in my intro talking about how you can't, you know, even me growing up with a healthy dose of respect for the military, then when you live in Southern California, you naturally have friends who serve, who did serve. And so it's a little hard not to, you know, kind of sink into that's part of our culture down here as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I would love to get into talking in the next segment we're coming up with. I would love to get into talking about what you're currently doing as you left the military and are supporting people who are in that transition process. Um, As you know, I work in the industry where I'm helping veterans who are going through the disability compensation process and how that kind of navigating that process. And I know you have some familiarity with that as you're helping people through this as well. Um, So if we kind of go into the next segment, I would love to have that conversation with you. Um, I also want to give a little shout out to his wonderful wife, who is a registered nurse and his daughter, who is a nurse as well. So they are also serving people as well. So, Mike, I will let you say something about your wife. Go ahead. No, I I thank you for for mentioning that. I was thinking about that in the back of my head. And, you know, it's so true. And it's so I'm so grateful to be married to Claire, not not just because of the person that she is, that she does have a heart of service and. You know, that really came into focus in this last year uh, with this pandemic, the true heroes that we have in the medical field um, out there um, just serving uh, people in need. So uh, thanks for mentioning them both. Absolutely. We're going to take a break and we will be back with Mike, U.S. Navy veteran on the Veterans Voice with KABC 790 Los Angeles. Good evening, everyone. This is Amanda Manier with the Veterans Voice. I am a veteran advocate and attorney at the Veterans Law Group. And uh, we're talking, we visited tonight with Mike. He is a U.S. Navy veteran. We talked in the previous segment about his military career. And then I just want to get into a little bit about what he's currently doing as far as helping veterans and helping transitioning military. Uh, Mike, are you here with us? I am, Amanda. Awesome. Thank you for being here. Um, why don't you go ahead and just tell us a little bit about what you're currently doing. You left the military a couple of years ago, retired, I think you said after 22 years. That's correct. Yes, I retired in 2013 and then began working as a government service employee. And I was doing uh, chief of staff work for one of our West Coast groups with Naval Special Worker. And I had done that for about six and a half years when the, the opportunity uh, arose uh, the commander uh, at the time, uh, Admiral Shemansky, was looking uh, to assist the Naval Special Warfare personnel. Uh, unfortunately, as a result of the catalyst of that was uh, some catastrophic events that had occurred within our formation uh, in leading up to transition. And then some folks, you know, post-transition we did have a few suicides as well. And so he really wanted to take action and do something about uh, preparing folks uh, for transition. And so he was talking about putting together a, a focused effort uh, to align some resources to assist not just the service members, but families prior to their release from active duty service to be fully prepared for post-military life and reduce some of these catastrophic events. And when I heard about that, that was right in my wheelhouse and something I was very passionate uh, about uh, and I was as I was helping folks uh, within the group uh, transition. And so when I when I mentioned that, he uh, he brought me up to the Naval Special Warfare uh, Command and helped uh, I helped start the program back in May 2019. So currently I'm the director of what's called the Readiness for Soft Transition Program with Naval Special Warfare. Well, and I want to back up with something that you just said about these catastrophic events, because there has been, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but within the last week, there was a study that was released that found out that more than four times as many troops have died from suicide than have died from combat within the last, I believe, 15 years. Um, It's something that we deal with a lot here um, with working with people who have mental health issues, mostly related Mm -hmm. to post-traumatic stress. Um, Mm -hmm. 
but also that uh, you and you brought that up that transition is not always just the mental health issues it's that transition process of going from a world in which you you know had support and had community and all of that kind of thing and then you're kind of transitioning out and not really having a direction or way to go which i think is so amazing about what you're doing yeah absolutely and it's often this veteran life that we don't the military as a whole it doesn't necessarily you know uh, focus on because what they're what they what they really are are focused on is the is the operational time for an individual in service right and so we spend a lot of time and resources in bringing the right people in to the military and training them giving them the tools and the resources to succeed uh, maybe removing even some of the obstacles that they might have to to serving and in and so that they can focus on the mission at hand. And um, although, you know, Congress has mandated that each of the services provide assistance for transition, they're doing what they and they're doing what they can. Uh, there's just so much that happens over the lifespan of a career that it really takes a considerable amount of time and effort to prepare somebody successfully to to uh, handle that part of their life, right? Their veteran life. And the reality is that they spend more time in the veteran life than they do actually in uniform. Yeah, generally they do. Um, And, you know, as I had mentioned that I'm kind of helping people through the disability compensation process, which, you know, isn't a magic wand or anything that's going to resolve any of the issues. Like I talk all the time about how you know, helping somebody get compensation for their PTSD isn't going to make the PTSD go away. But I look at it as helping them to provide a financial foundation so that they can get help if that's what they need. And it sounds like a lot of what you're doing is to help them with that process even before they even get out is to not just the disability compensation, but how do you create that foundation for them once they get out of the military? Right. Yeah, we really have three lines of effort. And one is that we educate the force in, the, in how transition and the fact that they're going to transition at some point. And so we want them to be prepared throughout their career to have a successful transition. So we educate the force and then we guide them through the process map of transition because many folks think, oh, I just need another job. And that's mm-hmm. my transition is just what am I going to do next? And mm-hmm. there's just so much more, as you probably know, working with veterans that there's just so much more that is part of that transition. It's really a new life, right? So we kind of guide them through the process map of that transition. And the last uh, line of effort is that we connect them to the appropriate resources that are tailored to them as individuals. And then not just them, but their families as well, so that they are connected to the right resources. Uh, Overall, the vision for the readiness for soft transition is that we'll support force readiness by producing resilient, well-adjusted Naval Special Warfare personnel and their families while they're in service, but who successfully transition to thriving veteran lives. Yeah, absolutely. And that just, uh, we're, we're talking with Mike, who is a U.S. Navy veteran, which is the veteran's voice, and we're talking about how he um, helps support people who are transitioning from out of the Navy, out of the, you know, serving into the veteran life. Um, Mike, what are some of the, like, I don't know, words of advice that you would give to somebody? It's obviously somebody being in your program. I'm sure there are people who were serving in the military now going, well, how do I get in that kind of program? And even if they're not able to do that, what are some words of advice that you, having been in the military, transitioned out, have a thriving career helping veterans? What are some of the, I don't know, like I said, words of advice that you would give to somebody who's transitioning? Yeah, I would say that uh, the time to be thinking about transition is not two months before, you know, the end of your EALS or, you know, when you pick your retirement date and you're two months away. So the if I could say anything, it's to start early uh, and thinking about uh, transition. And it does take time. It takes more time, I would argue, to leave the service than it does to get into the service mm-hmm. uh, yeah. because you want to be thinking about uh, what does my life look like? You know, what do I want it to be? Who am I becoming in that regard? And and so uh, we typically recommend that people begin earnestly preparing for transition at least two years prior to mm-hmm. transition. Uh, and, and, and what that looks like is, is 
first and foremost, making sure that they've addressed all of the medical issues that they sure. may have been avoiding over the life of their career because they've wanted to stay operational or, right. you know, they there's I don't want to go to the doctor because uh, then I won't be able to you know deploy or do my mission. So they're just going to give me Motrin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to do anything. <laughs> I hear that all the time. Well, they're just going to give me Motrin and send me back to work. So I have three bottles. I just should take that. Right. I can self-medicate. Yeah. And that happens in other <laughs> ways as well, right? You know, um, and so what uh, we recommend folks do is do a very thorough uh, medical history, uh, fill out the D2807 and fill it out um, in, in a way that you've like you're 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 starting from the top of your head down to the bottom of your toes and you're, mm. you're addressing every single uh, issue that may uh, be there. Even if it's, if it seems minor, because you want to yeah. have uh, access when you do have access to care, right? Like you do in, in uh, when you're in active duty service uh, to take care of those things. So that further on down the road, uh, when you're utilizing the VA services, there's a service connection. And so that's why yeah. and sometimes that takes a long time. So that's why we recommend two years prior to transition. Yeah. yeah, and I often, one of the hardest, I mean, obviously, if a veteran is coming to a law firm to get help, it, they're not an easy case, right? The easiest right. case, I have to remind myself all the time in my cynical view of the VA that they do get it right at times. I just see the cases yeah. that they're not getting it right. And one of the most common things I see is a veteran who left the service, didn't seek seek any sort of medical treatment, but had an injury, like a back injury in service. And then 10 years later, that back injury has progressively gotten worse and worse. And now they're trying to seek service connection for it because maybe they're having a hard time working or, um, you know, just dealing with the pain of it. And I always tell veterans, it's like, you know, if you, if you get out of the military, even if it's a 0% service connection, that is going to be, that's you've crossed the biggest hurdle, which is to get service connection. And you never know down the road, whether you're going to need it or not. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was when we started this program, that was really needed to be a key factor. Um, and, and it, and as such, I brought on nurse case managers who were trained to be able to, in these complex cases, to be able to talk with an individual, um, and, and go through their medical records and help them to, you know, verbalize. Cause sometimes they don't know what they don't know. And right. And ver verbalizing, what uh, those kinds of uh, injuries are and making sure that they're appropriately documented first and foremost so that mm -hmm. they can get it treated while they're still in service and then uh, and then also documented for follow-on uh, care once they are out and they um, they, they utilize the, the VA benefits and I can tell you that um, you know I think through through our efforts and the effort, efforts of great veteran service organizations that are out there like the DAV and VFW and Warrior and others um, who have veteran service officers that are working with uh, uh, active duty service members um, that, that it's getting better than it had been mm -hmm. in the past. Certainly better than even seven or eight years ago when I was getting out. <laughs> Definitely. And, you know, that information wasn't wasn't there. And I had to, you know, kind of redo my claim because I I, I left mm -hmm. many pieces out that I just didn't think were relevant. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mike. I can you can hear the music coming on and we're reaching the end of our segment. But I so much appreciate you being here. I appreciate your service and your family's friendship all of these years um, and everything that you're doing to help people as they transition through. Um, you're listening to Amanda Manier with the Veterans Voice on KABC 790 out of Los Angeles. Good evening, everyone. This is Amanda Manier. You are listening to the Veterans Voice. I am a veteran advocate and attorney with the Veterans Law Group. Um, we do all things VA disability claims, primarily in the appeals department. And one of the things I just wanted to do with this show is to spend some time highlighting veterans, celebrating veterans, and also organizations that are supporting veterans. Um, in our last segment, we talked a bit with Mike, who is a U.S. Navy veteran and is also helping people with the transition process. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what he does um, or helping to support the organization that he's working with, you can definitely reach out. Um, you can reach out to us at veteranslaw.com and I will make that connection. Um, this next segment, what I would love to do is to introduce you to Star. 
And Star, we only use first names around here, so you are more than welcome to talk about whatever you would like to talk about. Uh, Star is a U.S. veteran, a U.S. Air Force veteran. And um, let's just start with introducing a little bit about you, how you ended up getting interested in joining the military, and what made you decide to join the Air Force. So uh, I had decided to join the military. I grew up um, with my grandfather, who was a World War II Vietnam Korea um, veteran. He was in the Navy, um, and he had retired after 20-some-odd years of being in the military. And so I, he loved to talk about all of his time overseas and everything. And so um, growing World up War in the II, same Korea household as and him... Vietnam? He was a uh, part Vietnam too, um, in the beginning wow. of Vietnam. So wow. he was like the end of world war two. He went all the way through Korea and then part of Vietnam. Um, so he's one of those very few <laughs> that served, um, and got a lot of different experience, um, in the different sure. wars, but he, I bet he had some good stories. He did. He had amazing <laughs> stories and, um, he was just always so happy. Um, even though he went through a lot of different tragic events and lost a lot of different people, um, the military was just something that he always talked about, you know, changing his life, um, and how important it was to him. And so it was just something that I always just had in the back of my mind that I wanted to do. Um, mm-hmm. I had thought about joining the Marine Corps, um, but after talking to my family and everything, everybody kind of persuaded me to join the Air Force. And so after long debates, I finally decided just to join the Air Force, and I was in it for four years and absolutely loved it. Awesome. And tell me a little bit about what you did in the Air Force. So I was security forces, law enforcement, um, and it's, I'm one of those few that joined and actually requested that. Um, they tried to talk me out of it when I went in and talked to the recruiter because of my scores. Um, I actually had some high scores where they said, you know, you could, you could pick anything you want. Go ahead. And they said, no, I want to do security forces. I wanted to go in and work with the canine unit, um, but I just mm-hmm. didn't stay in long enough to get over to um, training with them. So. Awesome. And what years did you serve? From 2008 until 2012. Okay. So I imagine you probably spent some time overseas. Middle East? I did, I did one um, tour overseas, yes, in the Middle East. Okay. And um, as far as like your military career, we're going to get into the next segment. I'm going to talk a little bit about more about what we do as far as disability compensation and your experience with that and that kind of thing. Um, I I will want, I do want to get into a little bit more about your grandfather, if that's okay. Do you feel comfortable with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, what would you say like your favorite story that he told you about, about being a veteran and um, did he enjoy being a veteran? Did he like when people acknowledged him being a veteran or was he a little shy about it he loved it he was one of those he didn't tell all of his stories um like he wasn't open about a lot of it but there were things that he loved to talk about and he was very very proud um to be a veteran and to you know be acknowledged Mm, absolutely and And um, do you do you feel the same way because that people feel a little like and we're coming up on the fourth of july and we just went through memorial day and we've got veterans day and it's always some, something that's interesting that when i do interviews people ask me like what should you say to veterans like should you say thank you for your service is that weird you know i, I would just love your honest answer on that like how do you feel about that i enjoy it i really do um like when people recognize it not necessarily like me um not saying you know it's, I love that they say thank you um, for your service. And it's kind of hard because it's like, you know, what do you say back? <laughs> Usually mm-hmm. I'm like, thank you for mm-hmm. thanking me. Um, but it's just the fact that they're acknowledging um, that they appreciate veterans. Like to me, it's that overall, you know, um, that I'm just one of many. And so the fact that they're thanking me, it's kind of like they're thanking everybody. Um, so mm-hmm. I really like to see when people do that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're talking with Star. She is a United States Air Force veteran. You're listening to the Veterans Voice on KABC out of Los Angeles. My name is Amanda Manier, and I am a veteran advocate and attorney. And Star is not only a veteran, but she's also a paralegal in our office. And so we're going to dig into a little bit about that in the next segment about kind of that process. Um, but I wanted to just for the first segment here to really kind of acknowledge her family and her service um, with the and with the United States Air Force. And Star, your husband is also Air Force, correct? He is. That's how we met each other. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he also served overseas and you have that kind of whole history together. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to talk in here in a few minutes again about you being a paralegal here. Would you kind of start with how you became a paralegal? Why were you interested in that? So I um, didn't know about the VA appeals process um, when I was going to par the paralegal program. I was actually um, working with the Grossmont College um, as the like through the veterans um, like assistance program where, you know, you walk in and to use your chapter 31 or 33 mm -hmm. benefits. And um, one of the girls there was talking about, you know, a paralegal program and just something so that I could get a job and not be um, just like an intern there. And so I went to the paralegal program and as I was going through it, I kept mentioning about how, you know, I'm a veteran and I wanted to find a job working with veterans. And um, one of the counselors pointed out that there is, you know, that there's a field um, for veteran VA law um, and mm -hmm. then had pointed me in the direction of veterans law group when there was an opening. So, well, you certainly how. aren't alone in that. I had worked for over 10 years as a business attorney and had no idea that this was an area of law that I could even work in or that it was even needed. You know, we've, you and I have talked about this many times of like, yeah. I wish that we didn't have this job because it should not be necessary. We shouldn't, veterans shouldn't have to call an attorney to get their VA benefits, but here we are every single day dealing with the VA and helping and support veterans. It's a, kind of an exactly. honor and in, in able to do that. Um, but it definitely shouldn't be necessary. Yeah. And I'm going to dig into a little bit as comfortable as you feel like talking about it again is, is your kind of history and process of going through it. Or um, we're going to talk about some of the clients that you've, that you've helped navigate this process. Um, I asked Ed about this on a couple of weeks ago when I had Ed, who was also a paralegal in our office talking about this as we brought up the, uh, what we call the VA shame board in there about some of the kind of weirdness. I mean, I would call it weirdness, wouldn't you? With a weirdness that comes out of the VA. Oh yes. <laughs> All of the, the different errors and things that you would, you don't expect to ever see. <laughs> well, and and people ask me all the time. They're like, um, "What is going on with the VA? Like, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Like, if I asked you that question, how would you feel about have working, not only being a veteran and being in the you know VA system, but also being a paralegal as what you, with us five years, I believe, is um, you know, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? What, how would how would you respond to that?" I wouldn't really say that it's getting better and I wouldn't say it's, I, it, I kind of feel like it's the same. Um, the process has changed, but we're still getting the same kind of mistakes happening. We're still getting the, the same type of denials and, you know, the same amount of people coming to us with the same type of problems. And so it's still the same issues over and over again. And, you know, they're simple fixes. They're, there are things that, you know, shouldn't, mistakes that shouldn't be made. And so I kind of feel like they're not getting, they're not getting any better with the changes that they have. 
Well, it's kind of that thing of I describe. I have I have the very same response where I'm like, well, it's getting better, but it's getting worse in other ways. Um, exactly. It's that you you know you talk about a bureaucracy and you know you add some new rules to it to change the rules, but yet they have to follow the old rules too. And really, what it comes down to, it's a bureaucracy that is lacking accountability to exercise their you know their authority and the things that they're supposed to do. You've got people who've been working there for 20 years. And I think to a certain extent, I've talked about a little bit of the cynicism that I have, and I'm sure that that happens internally as well. Um, when we get back, I would love to chat with you a little bit about your experience of going through the compensation process, talk about CNP exams a little bit, um, and uh, see if we can help some people, give them some good advice. All right. That sounds good. You're listening to the Veterans Voice. Thank you. Um, this is Amanda Manier uh, with the Veterans Voice on 790 KABC out of Los Angeles. Good evening. You're listening to the Veterans Voice. I am Amanda Manier. I'm a veteran advocate and attorney at the Veterans Law Group. And uh, we help out veterans through the whole disability compensation process. But what this show is really about is to help highlight and celebrate veterans and organizations that are helping veterans either after they leave the military or during the transition process. Um, also like to highlight some stuff in the news, as well as things that are affecting veterans as well. Um, this evening we're joined by Star. She is a United States Air Force, Air Force veteran. She is also a paralegal in our office. And during the last segment, we spent some time talking about her military career, her family, how she got into it. And now I'd like to just switch gears a little bit and put your paralegal hat on but also your veteran hat. So we're going to talk about your process as you went through the disability compensation and then kind of what you learned from being a paralegal on the other side, supporting veterans walking through this process. Um, okay. and, and I, again, I'll reiterate the fact that you can talk about as much as you want to, but I'm not going to push you to talk about your different ratings and all that kind of thing. I just want you to talk a little bit about the process itself. Um, when you were coming out of the military, how familiar were you with the process of getting your disability rating? How much education were you given? I was not given any education. Um, I had one individual, they had a, a veteran service officer um, that came in during our out processing, which I wasn't there for majority of it because I had just had my son. Um, so I had missed a lot of time. You know, I was still part of like my, my six weeks um, maternity leave. And so I didn't get a lot of the in-depth, um, well, what they were considering in-depth training of different things. Um, I just had like a quick run through and they basically said that they were, they wanted a copy of my medical records. They gave it to a VSO. They had her review it. She came back and said, this is what I see. This is what you could put in if you want to and help me, you know, just here's the paperwork. You got to sign it and send it off. And that was so it. So she was, <laughs> she was pretty much looking through your current records and telling you what you could claim, but not really helping you to document things that maybe you hadn't gone to medical for. Is that fair to say? Exactly. Yeah. She didn't discuss anything with me. Um, she had me write before she reviewed the medical records. She had me write down a list of, you know, what was wrong with myself. Um, mm -hmm. And then, it wasn't like, oh, well, I see this or I don't see this or you should go in and you shouldn't go in. Um, so there was there was just so much missing. OK. And uh, interestingly enough, like I hear and I just want to maybe reiterate for the public that, you know, it's part of your contract going into the military. We make an agreement with you as, as civilians, part of your contract, that any injury in which you have, which is incurred, they call it incurred while you're in service or aggravated, maybe you had a previous injury and it was aggravated while you were in service, that if you have a disability coming out of the military on that, that we will compensate you for that. So generally what they look at is, okay, you have a back injury that happened in service, you're currently dealing with a back injury, and so we then, the VA through their magical formula decides, okay, you have a 10% back injury, a 40% back injury, and then they will look at all of your injuries and decide what your overall percentage is, and that's what you're compensated for. And I was talking with Mike in previous segments about, 
you know, veterans who somewhat kind of resist the process at the beginning because they're, oh, I don't need that help or somebody else needs it more than me. And we've talked many times about this of explaining to veterans that you getting that compensation doesn't take away from somebody else getting it. And so, you know, going through this process is is incredibly important because down the road, 20 years from now, you could be dealing with something that is prohibiting your ability to work. And you and I work with people like that. Exactly. And I think another thing to add to is um, you mentioned injury, but a lot of people don't realize that a a lot of the ones that I see is illness and mental illness. Um, I have a lot of friends that I came out of the military alongside of that had mental illness, um, that they either were, you know, separated for or separated and then realized um, that like their schizophrenia or, you know, being bipolar was aggravated by the military service. And so they didn't realize until way later, you know, to bring that up, but it's hard to service connect it if you're not Mm -hmm. getting it documented while you're in. Right. And we're working with a lot of people who, it may be years later that they finally got a diagnosis and then they're realizing, oh, that's what was going on with me. You know, the sleepless nights, the, uh, you know, anxiety, all of that kind of thing that they didn't really necessarily know. So when we, you were talking a little bit about transitioning out and I hear this a lot of that, it's called the TAPS class, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and people who, you know, it's one of the many boxes that you're supposed to check when you're getting out of the military and most people are just ready to get out. So even, you know, outside of you were off on leave because you had your son, other people actually go through that class, but do not absorb it because it's again, one of many boxes you've got to check in order to get out of the military. And it doesn't seem as important at the time as it may later. Exactly. And you have so much going on because you're still working. They still have you work until the very last day. Um, and you got to think, you know, you're, you're thinking about moving back home. So you're cleaning out, you know, your rental place or you're cleaning out your dorm room. Um, you're having parties with all of your friends because, you know, you're probably never going to see any of them again. Um, so you have so much going on at the same time. And the last thing that you want to really focus on is all of those boxes to check. And you're going to be so extremely tired that, you know, you're not going to focus on all those classes because you're like, oh, I can figure this out later. Yeah, definitely. Uh, We're we're talking with Star. She is a U.S. Air Force veteran and also a paralegal that helps veterans through this process. And this is the Veterans Voice. I am Amanda Manier with the Veterans Advocate and attorney at the Veterans Law Group. Um, Star, what would you say would be maybe your best piece of advice for a veteran as they're approaching this whole process? So coming out of the military or filing a claim for the first time or um, I would say approaching the process of getting the dis- their disability compensation. So um, my the best advice I can give is <laughs> be prepared for a long haul. Um, Mm. You know, don't, don't be discouraged by the first round, um, like the first decision that you're going to get. And Mm. when you do apply, apply for everything. Um, And don't think that because it's been so long, especially for, you know, older veterans. Uh, My grandpa was 90, three when we finally put in um, for him again, because he had, Mm. everybody had discouraged him along the way until I finally talked him into it again. Um, So it doesn't matter how long it's been put in for everything that you feel the military aggravated, like you incurred or the military aggravated. um, Yeah. And sometimes it's not just about, you know, we were talking earlier about people who feel like, Oh, I don't need it. Somebody else needs it more, that kind of thing. Um, some of the important stuff that comes down to it is that your spouse and your family may be entitled to stuff should you you know, pass on because of a service-connected disability. So it's not always just about the veteran themselves, but it's about their family, their children getting 
benefits to education and that kind of thing. And again, I always go back to the fact that this was part of the contract that we signed. You know, you guys go, don't get paid anything while you're in the military. <laughs> so the least that we can <laughs> exactly. do is help to like support your family and support your, and especially an injury that happened while you were serving overseas or just being, you know, part of the entire time, you know, you're owned by the military for those 10 years or however much you serve, whether you're at work or not. Um, and that's one of the things that's a misconception as well is an injury that happened to you while you were, you know, off duty is still an injury while you happened in, to be in the military and they will still support you for that. Exactly. Um, the, the other question I get a lot is about CNP exams, and we just have a couple minutes left here. But um, CNP exams is something a comp and pension exam that you get called into doing. You have to do it in order to show up, or in order to get rated. You have to do those. They're nerve wracking. I understand that because you're being evaluated. Do you have a your first best tip as far as going in those exams, other than show up? Oh, yes. Always make sure that you go to the CMP exams no matter what, because if you don't go, the VA can take it away from you or deny you right away. Um, and I would always say that um, to bring somebody along with you that knows you. Um, mm -hmm. So if it's your spouse, especially, you know, if it's like you have a sleep problem or if it is for like PTSD or um, depression or anything like that, the it's harder for you to remember things on the spot. So, you know, make a list and also bring somebody with you that can bring things up and talk about it that you might not be able to. Um, and they can, you know, vouch and explain a little bit better um, and kind of be there for you. And it's also a good support system for after the fact, because my husband and I do that for each other and I did it with my grandfather um, and so, especially with the mental CMP exams, um, you know, it's always really difficult. I hate to cut you off. We're at the end of our time, but thank you so much for being here. You're listening to the Veterans Voice with Amanda Manier, the Veterans Law Group.